Hey there, Touch Designer Developers, Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're going to create an effect inspired by the work of photographer Bernice Abbott. If you're not familiar with her work already, she did a actually a very wide variety of different uh, photographic artwork and work during the 20th century. Most specifically, we're going to focus on work that she did for the scientific community starting in the 1940s. So she was both an inventor and a photographer during this time, coming up with different uh, tools and techniques, which she eventually patented some of, uh, to photograph more effectively scientific phenomena. And we're going to build an effect today that is based on some of her multiple exposure uh, photographs that she's well known for. Uh, so as usual, this is going to be a ton of fun to put together. So stick around. We're going to jump right into it. So before we get into the effect, let's just take a brief look at Bernice's background because she has a very interesting trajectory, which kind of leads her to the uh, scientific photography that we're going to be uh, taking inspiration from. So here she is probably sometime between the 20s and 40s. Uh, with one of her large format cameras. This is the sort of camera that she would be using for a lot of the photographs that we'll be looking at. Uh, the benefit of having such a large camera is that you end up with a very large negative, which means that basically in, in the kind of digital terms of today, the resolution of your photo is very great and you also can have a very finite control over uh, a lot of different things, including the dynamic range of the image, but that is all kind of film stuff for another day. Also remember that Bernice was later on an inventor of many different uh, innovations for the photographic world, especially in terms of her goal of kind of capturing these scientific um, discoveries and and sort of scientific properties and things like that. So some of the things that she um, was working on later on were special tripods. I'm not sure if this is one of them, but she developed a number of special tripods uh, and other, again, related innovations, which she would get patents for later on. Here she is a little bit later, maybe in the 50s or 60s, again, with uh, one of her many cameras. And to give you a, a very brief background, she is born into a poor family in the Midwest uh, around a little bit before the, uh, the turn of the century um, and eventually makes her way to Paris in the kind of uh, 1910s or so and falls in with a group of artists. There's a huge artistic community, a lot of uh, expats from the US and elsewhere at the time who are kind of congregating on Paris as a, as a cheap place to live and uh, sort of artistic. There's sort of an artistic uh, community and, and zeitgeist that's happening there. And so she ends up meeting um, uh, or I guess running into Man Ray, who was a famous uh, kind of experimental photographer and artist at the time. And she becomes his assistant, uh, not really knowing anything about photography. So she is sort of uh, trained through working in his facility and uh, assisting him on uh, many of his works during a number of years, I think around the late uh, teens to early 20s, and then starts to take photographs of her own. So she starts off by just uh, taking portraits of uh, people that were kind of in this artistic community on her lunch break. And this here is actually a photograph of James Joyce, but she took photos of many of the people who are now very well known as having a, a big impact on the kind of uh, arts of the 20th century. So she was, you know, right there, uh, a part of this community and kind of documenting it as it was happening. Eventually, she ends up back in New York City and starts to or ma makes a kind of shift into documenting uh, city life and the kind of architecture of the day. So this is a photograph of Penn Station. Uh, for all you New Yorkers out there, this is the original Penn Station, which uh, unfortunately was torn down in the 60s for the kind of terrible, uh, <laughs> the terrible station that we have today. Uh, but anyway, she captured some very amazing and beautiful photographs of that structure and many, many others. Uh, here's one of Grand Central that's particularly famous. So she has this period where she's documenting, um, again, this, uh, this sort of city life during the... Um, 
kind of uh, 1930s or so during the Depression. And then uh, during the early parts of World War II and beyond, she shifts gears once again and decides that the most important thing for her to focus on at this point is science, because this is kind of the era of, uh, you know, big leaps in terms of scientific discovery and things like that. So she starts to develop uh, not only her own photographic techniques with the technology that exists, but she also starts to build some new technology and, and create some inventions of her own, as I talked about at the beginning. So um, eventually, it takes her a long time to kind of take this into the uh, commercial sphere because a lot of the scientists at the time didn't take her seriously uh, as a woman and as a photographer. Uh, they felt, I guess, that, you know, what would they have to contribute to that kind of a, a profession? But uh, nonetheless, she persevered and eventually got to uh, work on some very famous, um, or, or got to create a, a number of very famous photographs for MIT, who was working on uh, putting together a textbook after the Sputnik uh, satellite launched in the late 50s. So she really got to take her techniques that she had honed, her tools, and put them into action and create some really amazing photographs of a lot of uh, scientific um, knowledge and, and properties that in a lot of cases hadn't really been photographed or, or seen in a very effective way. So uh, these things that we're looking at are probably produced by uh, things like long exposures, and as we'll see here, uh, things like multiple exposures as well. So the multiple exposure is the, the kind of impetus for the effect that we're taking today or we're, that we're creating today, and that is the ability uh, with a film camera to basically take a number of successive pictures on the same frame of the film that is loaded into the camera. So what that means is you're basically opening the shutter on the camera a number of times to capture light onto the film itself without kind of advancing to the next picture. So this is, you know, nowadays you can do this kind of stuff with digital cameras and of course with stuff like Photoshop, and it's not really a big deal, but uh, back then it was, uh, it was possible with manual cameras to do, but creating very effective and um, uh, well-balanced in terms of lighting and exposure um, images like we see here was not necessarily the simplest thing to achieve. So anyways, that should give you a uh, not exactly super brief, but hopefully interesting look into her background and kind of where we are taking our inspiration from. Let's now dive into Touch Designer where we're going to build our effect. Okay, so starting out with a blank network, we're going to focus on a uh, simple sort of image generation portion first, and then we'll build the actual effect, the uh, so-called multi-exposure effect, which really is just a simple feedback loop. So to start, we're going to add in a movie file in, and we're going to use the good old uh, banana image that we touch designer users all know and love for this particular effect. So I'm going to Basically just leave that as is, um, and then I will add a transform directly after the movie file in. So the transform we're gonna use to add a movement to this banana. We're going to move it around on screen with some chop channels, and that will allow us to have a little bit more um, of a dynamic image. You'll notice with Bernice's images, um, uh, they are often capturing some sort of object in motion. And so this is going to be our object that we are capturing in this case. So I'm going to then add a noise chop to actually provide those uh, position values that we're gonna shift this banana around with. So for the noise top, I'm going to set uh, the uh, period, that is, to 5. And then I'll come to the channel page. I'm going to change the channel name here to TX for Translate X. I'm going to add a second one by um, hitting the space bar and then typing in TY, 
and hitting enter and that will then give us two different channels. And then uh, on the common page, I'm gonna turn time slicing on so that we get the output of that um, multi-sample uh, chop as single samples, allowing us to apply animation. So from there, I'm going to add a null and then this null I'm going to call null transform because we're going to use it to transform the banana's position. Within the transform, I will then make a chop reference from the TX channel to translate, and uh, the TY channel will go to translate Y. Now immediately we should see the banana moving around in space. Uh, the other thing that I think I'm gonna do here is to reduce the scale of this banana. So it's a little bit big, it's taking up a lot of the screen real estate at the moment, and I want it to be a little bit, a little bit smaller than that. So I'm going to set the scale here to a value of 0 0.5, so very small. You can also play around with the transform order as well. So another option might be instead of scaling first and translating last uh, is to translate first and then scale later on. So you'll notice if you flip between the first mode and one of these last ones, it will change the uh, basically the magnitude of the movement of the object. So um, it's kind of up to you what you want to choose. You can also always attenuate the, the range of values within the noise itself. But, um, you know, this translate rotate scale looks all right in this current uh, kind of mode. So I'm going to I'm going to leave that alone. Next up, we're going to add in an HSV adjust so that that is going to be used to allow us to color cycle our banana a little bit instead of just leaving it at its sort of default yellow state. So the hue offset parameter here allows us to cycle through different uh, hue uh, options for our banana. And what we're going to do is to set up an expression for us that will uh, animate this automatically. Now, one interesting thing to note about the hue offset parameter specifically is that it's actually clamped to a minimum of negative 360. If we try to go below that, it will automatically jump back to 360. And the same goes for the maximum, which is a value of positive 360. That, again, will clamp anytime you go beyond that. So if we were to type in something like abs time dot seconds and hit enter, it looks as though we've hit a static value of 360 and nothing's happening. And that really is because we're clamped at that maximum value and abs time.seconds probably has a value much higher than 360 by this point. So what we're gonna do is write a nice little Python expression, uh, use some math to get this back into the range that we want it to be in. So first of all, we're going to multiply uh, abs time dot seconds by a value of 150, <clears throat> which will allow us to increase the rate of change of that value. Now, again, it's not going to look like anything is happening because we currently are beyond that clamped uh, limit. So to alleviate that and to allow us to have this value kind of wrap around between those limits, we're gonna use a modulo function. So to do that, we're going to add a modulo operator, which is the percent sign, and then we will type in a value of 720. Now, where am I getting 720 from? So if we look at the range of this parameter, negative 360 to positive 360, if we were to shift that range up to starting at zero, the maximum actually is 720. So it's the, the difference between the maximum and the minimum of our hue offset range. Now, leaving this expression as it is, you'll notice that we get a little bit of animation between zero and 360, and then, oh, we hit that limit again once we hit 360, and that's because we're actually outputting uh, currently with this expression, range of values between zero and 720. So we need to basically adjust the range of the values that we're outputting. And we can do that very simply by subtracting from the final value here. And if we subtract 360 specifically, we now have a nice looping 
animating uh, value that will smoothly transition between all these different colors and um, will fall neatly into the range that we want it to. So that is all that we need to do for this particular um, texture. The other thing though that I want to make sure before we get to our feedback effect, at some point along the line, whether it's here or in the next couple of operators, we want to make sure that our format, our pixel format is set to 16 bit fixed. And that has to do with uh, reducing artifacting that can happen when we're dealing with transparent textures like this one and transparency in feedback loops. So. I guess we can do it here. I will, uh, I will do it on this HSV adjust so you can also do the same. So what I'm gonna do is come to the common page, set the pixel format here to 16-bit fixed RGBA, and there we go. It doesn't look like anything's happened and not a whole lot has. So next up, we're going to add a noise. So the noise is going to be used to add some displacement to this texture. This is how I was able to get those very kind of wonky, uh, distorted and warped bananas in the intro was by using a little bit of displacement. So for the noise, we need to change a number of things as usual. So I'm gonna set the, the period here to 10. I'm gonna turn monochrome off so we end up with some nice color noise. I'll set my seed to, I don't know, something else, anything really doesn't matter. And then let's go and set our resolution before we take this any further. So I'm gonna set the resolution here to 1280 by 720. I just happen to know that uh, the banana uh, image is 1280 by 720. So that's what we're gonna do for the noise. Once again, I'm gonna set the pixel format to a higher value. This can be um, in, in this case, actually a float uh, pixel format because displacement can happen in the positive or negative direction. And we um, we want to kind of utilize that whole range of values that we could generate. So I'm gonna leave it on the 16-bit float setting. And then the final thing we're gonna do here is to add some uh, Python expressions with abs time.seconds to animate the noise so it's not just static. So what I'm gonna do, is type in abs time dot seconds, and I'm going to multiply it by a value of 0 0.06. And this was for the TX parameter, translate X. I'm gonna copy this and use it once again for the TZ parameter as well. So that will give us left to right movement and uh, Z movement, which will shift the noise through Z space. So that is all we need to do for that particular operator. Let's go ahead and connect those two to a displace top. So I'm gonna to connect the HSV adjust to the first input and the noise to the second input. So it's looking a little crazy at first and that's because the uh, displacement we're applying is actually pretty large at the moment. So first of all, let's, uh, let's set our horizontal and vertical source uh, parameters to the ones that I used for the effect. I ended up going with a horizontal source of the green color channel and then the vertical source I set to red. Then the uh, displace weight parameter is what is currently causing our image to look a little crazy. And so if we take that back to zero and then increase it a little bit from there, so I'm gonna increase this to a value of 0 0.2. Now we have a little bit more controlled displacement, which still adds some of that uh, interesting warping style effect, but does not nearly go as crazy as it was before. For the extend mode, I am just going to set this to zero. However, you could also set this to something like repeat or mirror, and that means when the texture is displaced off of the edge of the screen, it will wrap around using one of those uh, different modes. I'm just gonna leave it at zero so that no wrapping occurs. So with that, we are pretty much ready to roll uh, to, to be able to create our, our uh, multiple exposure effect. So let's go ahead and add a null to kind of like bookend this image input section of the network, and then we'll focus on the multi-exposure setup over here. The first thing that we need for this effect is a level top. 
good old level top. So the level top is going to be functioning somewhat like a shutter would on a camera in that it is going to be the gate, so to speak, uh, that allows this image, this banana image to be added into a feedback loop or it will turn it off and send nothing into the feedback loop. So think of it kind of like the shutter opening on a camera and allowing light in or closing and allowing nothing in. And the feedback loop itself, it kind of functions like a film would in a camera in that it is collecting light and uh, in this case, a texture and allowing us to sort of record these images. So there we go. We've got a level top. Let's go ahead and add the rest of our tops and then we'll get into uh, some chop functionality, which is kind of the core of generating this effect. So. As usual, I like to add a null before we get into a feedback loop in case we want to work with any additional operators. Let's also double check that we have a 16-bit fixed uh, pixel format, which we do. Then I'll attach a feedback top right over here. I will then attach from the output of that a composite. And then um, I will also connect the null to, to the composite. Now what we're gonna do here is set the composite operation to under. And we can experiment with a number of different modes which we'll look at later on, but that's just the one we're going to start with. To start actually generating the feedback, we need to set a target top. And so I'm going to drag the comp1 operator onto the comp1 parameter. And immediately we've got a cool kind of 70s uh, trailing effect going on. So that's, you know, already cool on its own, but we'll get into our multiple exposure business from there. So um, <clears throat> we can add a null after this if you want to do any post-processing. And then I usually will add in some kind of background to uh, alleviate, you know, this transparency that we've got going on. So we don't have to look at this checkerboard background. And so within the constant, I'm going to set the color to a light gray, maybe even a little bit lighter than that. And then I'll head to the output page where I will set the operation to under once again. The other thing that I want to do now that we are done with our feedback and displacement effects is to take our texture back into the default 8-bit fixed RGBA mode. Because if you were to use this within a project, uh, the higher bit depth will potentially cause some heavier processing loads uh, you know, in multiple areas of the network. So I just want to make sure that we're back to the usual default pixel depth there. Then I'm gonna add a null to the end. This will be our final kind of bookend null, which we can call something like null final, null out, whatever you want. And from there, we can get into the nuts and bolts of the chop network, which is going to create the multi-exposure effect. So for the chop portion of the network, we are going to start off with a keyboard in chop. And this is going to allow us to have some very fast and easy control over some of the different parameters that we'll be working with uh, so that we don't have to kind of click around and go into a bunch of different parameter windows to make things happen. So I'm going to grab the one, two, and three keys within the keys parameter of the keyboard in chop. And then I will go from there and use a select chop. I'm actually gonna use a total of three of these, so we might as well Go ahead and grab those now. We're gonna have three different branches, one for each of the keys. So the first one is going to be very simple. We're just going to grab the number one key and rename it to reset. And that will allow us to reset the feedback uh, once we have uh, you know, reached a state like this where either the screen is full or we want to start over with our image generation. So I'm going to just select that and then add a null and I'll call this one null reset. From there, I will make a chop reference to the reset on off switch within the feedback top. So let's go ahead and do that to the reset switch. And then if I hit the one key, I should see that feedback loop start over once again. On our second select, um, we can actually 
do these kind of in tandem because they're going to feed into the same operator, we're going to grab, you guessed it, the two key, uh, which is going to then be renamed to init for initialize. For the number three select there, we're going to grab the three key. And then we're going to rename that one to start. So the init and the start chop channels are going to be used for working with a timer chop. And the timer chop is what we're actually going to use to add some control over our quote unquote shutter, which again is that level one top down here. So let's go ahead and add the timer chop and we can start to look at our options. So if you're not familiar with it, the timer chop allows you to um, start a timer as you might expect and then trigger events when that timer ends or during that timer's run. There's also options for things like um, applying a, a kind of looping option which allows you to cycle the timer, restart it as soon as it ends uh, for a number of times, which we'll dig into in just a moment. So. I'm just going to go ahead and connect the init chop channel to the first input and then the start chop channel to the second input. What we should be able to do then is hit the two key and that will initialize the timer and then hit the one key or the, the three key rather and that should start the timer. So at any point if we want this timer to stop we just hit the two key again and it should initialize it. So that's great. Um, now, what exactly are we going to do with this? Well, what this operator has available to us besides, um, you know, allowing us to time certain functions is it has the handy cycle function, which I just mentioned. So if we turn cycling on and then we reduce our time here, let's just start with something like one second. The cycle setting is turned on. We have a maximum number of cycles set to a value of four. And so if I start the timer, every time that it hits the maximum or the end basically of uh, the timer, which is at one second, it starts itself over and then counts back to one again. So it will do that for as many times as you have set with this cycle limit and maximum cycles parameter. So if we want to have it loop four times, we set maximum cycles to four, we can increase or decrease that to whatever we want. So what does this have to do with our uh, shutter that we are building? So basically, the timer chop outputs a trigger or a pulse rather when you uh, enter into one of these cycles. And we're going to use that to briefly open our shutter, so to speak, which is going to involve turning the opacity of this level uh, top from zero to one. So just for a brief fraction of a second, we're going to turn that to full regular one level opacity, which will send it into our feedback loop. And then as quickly as it was uh, brought to that value, it will go back to zero and um, stop adding any additional frames into the feedback loop. So um, let's go ahead and set up this timer to make that functionality work. So first up within the timer is our length parameter, which we're going to uh, change the unit of, first of all. So right now it's set to seconds and we want this to be in frames rather than seconds. And we're going to set the length here to 20 frames to start. The reason that we are doing this in such a small unit of time, and uh, remember that we have 60 frames for every second in Touch Designer, at least with the current settings. This has to do with trying to replicate the type of images that Bernice was capturing with the film camera. So these are all objects that are in motion, but the motion that is being captured here is happening very rapidly. And in a lot of cases, probably faster than our eyes are even capturing and you know, would happen in, in what would be the blink of an eye, essentially. So what we need to do is to really capture the sort of trail or the, the path of motion of our banana. We want to have a very short uh, time frame over which we're capturing multiple different images. So we want to, you know, have those images be close enough together in time that we can see the kind of path of motion that the banana is taking. So that is why we are using the frames unit and setting it to such a small value. 
Now, maximum cycles, as we kind of alluded to, allows us to loop this timer a number of times. And if we're using the timer to basically trigger our shutter, that means we can choose how many total number of images we're taking in our multiple exposure via the maximum cycles parameter. So right now we would take four images, basically, if we took this uh, and left this setting as it is. I'm gonna set it to 15 because that's what we saw at the beginning of the video. And then we can come back and look at it again later. On the outputs page, we're going to change what chop channels we have available to us because we don't actually need all of them. We don't really need to see the timer fraction because that doesn't really pertain to this effect. We also don't really need to see ready either because again, it's not something we're gonna be using. We do, however, want to um, be able to see the done chop channel because it will show us when we have finished um, uh, basically taking all of our multiple exposures and it also will give us an idea of whether or not the timer has been initialized. Now the one that we want to turn on is the cycle pulse parameter which again will give us a pulse every time that we enter into a new cycle on the timer. So if I go ahead and hit two you can see when I initialize it the done uh, channel goes from one to zero. And then when I hit three, it will send out pulses on the cycle pulse channel. So after that, we're going to just go ahead and select this second chop channel specifically because that's the one that's going to control our shutter. I'm going to grab the channel named cycles pulse. And then I will add in a math chop, which we're not gonna do anything with at the moment, but we'll leave there for later. And then finally, I'm going to add in a null at the end. And this one I'm gonna call null space shutter. Great, so what can we do now? We're going to take this and make a chop reference from cycles pulse to the opacity uh, parameter on the post page of the level top. So go ahead and do that. I'm going to make the chop reference to that parameter, which will immediately cut it back to a value of zero. And you'll notice that we have, you know, this nice image uh, on screen, but we can go ahead and clear that out now and take a look at what our multiple exposure setup will generate for us. So I'm going to initialize, first of all, the timer by hitting the two key and then start it by hitting the three key. And there we go, our multiple exposure uh, banana bonanza has begun. So what exactly just happened here? So we have our timer outputting pulses, which is bringing our opacity from zero to a value of one, meaning we're sending for that brief frame a uh, this image of the banana into the feedback loop. And then as soon as it has been captured in the feedback loop, we are turning that opacity back to zero, meaning we're just sort of capturing a static image. And then we're doing the same thing at regular intervals. And because we have this feedback loop with the composite set up, those are all being composited together in a specific way. So basically, as I kind of mentioned briefly, the feedback loop is acting like the film in the camera might in that it is sort of accumulating the images, uh, which would be coming from, you know, uh, a light source and being applied to the film in the case of the camera. So what can you do with this now that we kind of have it set up and um, ready for you to experiment with? Well, first of all, there are tons and tons of different operations that you can play with within the composite. Uh, not all of them will work, uh, or at least work very well, I will point out, but you can definitely play around with a number of these different modes to have the multiple layers overlap in different ways. If we were to use something like add, which is maybe a little bit more similar to what would happen within a camera, the problem that we'll run into is that as these bananas overlap each other, uh, in a similar location, it's sort of accumulating the light, so to speak, at that position and turning um, that portion of the image white, which is a cool effect in its own, but you don't uh, necessarily see the discrete bananas as well that way. So the other thing to point out is that you can continue to add to the image by not resetting the feedback and starting the timer over again. And let me just set this back to under 
So we can see what that looks like without this particular blend mode. So I'm going to restart. So here's our first image. And once that completes, then I'll wait a second and now trigger the timer again. So you can really accumulate and build these much more uh, <laughs> complex and, and silly uh, images with the banana. Um, so that is one thing that I wanted to point out. Um, so play around with compositing. You can always, with feedback, add in different effects within the feedback loop, but note that anything that you do within the feedback loop, in this case, is going to uh, most likely have an impact on whether or not we kind of retain this static image. If you were to do something like add a transform, for example, or a level top or anything to sort of impact that signal over time, we no longer have this kind of static image that we're recording and it becomes a different effect altogether. So for example, transform, if I then increase this even slightly, you, see, you can see immediately that we lose the sharp image that we were building and it turns into um, you know, a feedback kind of trailing effect, which we could, you know, play around with and that's fun and cool. But, um, I just wanted to point that out that that is a possibility in itself. Um, if we want to kind of stick with the multiple exposure thing, let's take a look at some of the things we can do with the timer. So I'm going to restart or reset and within the timer, let's head back to the timer page. Let's say we keep or we reduce this length of time from 20 to 10. That is going to basically reduce the space between each image that is taken uh, in time, and thus they will be closer together and will capture more of that path of movement than we would otherwise. So that is something to think about. You can always um, you know, reduce that value even more, and then they'll be very close together you'll end up with something much closer to a trail than sort of discrete images. So that is an option there. We can also leave it at the kind of uh, default state and play around with the maximum number of cycles. So you could reduce this to like a value of four, like we had initially, and then we'll only have four different layers. And then you can keep adding to your image uh, with you know less going on. So those are some parameters that are definitely worth checking out. And then another thing that we added but haven't really touched on yet is this math chop. So let me just go ahead and reset this back to the uh, settings that we had before. I'm just setting my maximum cycles back to 15. The math chop here is basically controlling the, the level uh, at which the level top is going to uh, fall between. Like we can control the range of that value. So what that means is we don't have to always have our level top go from zero to one, giving us a uh, you know image without transparency. We can actually reduce that, say, to fall between zero and 0 0.5 instead with this math chop and take a look at what that produces. So I'm going to reset and then generate an image. So now you can see that our layers are actually transparent and will overlap in a, a different way than before in that we can see, you know, the, the, the points of overlapping and, and the multiple textures as a whole. So with this, uh, this ability here to control that uh, transparency and the compositing operations that we have, you can get very creative with how different things start to overlap with one another. The other thing, of course, is that you can play around with the type of image that is run into this effect. It doesn't necessarily have to be something with uh, so much transparency. You'd have to play around with your um, operations within the composite to make that function correctly, but this will work with just about anything. So that is it for this video. I hope that this has been inspirational for you to uh, think about how you can use some very simple tools like we have here, uh, including something like the timer chop and feedback to generate some very interesting, uh, potentially silly and fun, but also dynamic uh, images. And also how we can take inspiration from some of the more analog and mechanical processes from the past, as well as the artists of the past and the kind of ideas and images that they were working with.
uh, and translate those and use those as, as inspiration for the tools that we have available to us within Touch Designer. So with that, we're going to close out the video. Again, hope you have enjoyed putting this one together. As always, thanks so much for watching. Looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.